My guest this morning out of London, Ontario, is Professor Adrian Owen, who's at Western in London, the Brain and Mind Institute. He is the Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience. And what a pleasure it is to welcome you to our program, Professor. Thank you. Good morning, Heather. For people who are not familiar with your background, let me just set it up. Professor Owen is a world authority. He is very renowned in terms of the study of people with severe brain injury, the level of consciousness and awareness. That's the normal area of research. So I'm curious, Professor Owen, what has brought about this pivot in your focus toward COVID-19? Well, that's a very interesting question, Heather. I mean, uh, usually I spend my time in the ICU, this is b b before the COVID days, as you say, looking at patients who've had severe brain injuries. And, and all that science, all that research was, was shut down when the pandemic began. And, and actually, most of my team uh, were not able to access patients, were not able to carry on the, the normal scientific activities that we do. And then as, the, as the, the pandemic has rolled on, it's become apparent that people who are recovering from COVID-19 are experiencing neurological problems, including cognitive deficits. Many of them are reporting problems with concentrating, memory, and simple, simple problem solving. And, and we realize, well, there's, there is a role for us here. We need to start investigating these things and find out what's causing them, and if possible, what we can do to mitigate some of these problems. And hence the launch of this study, and a massive one at that. You're working with a stroke neurologist from Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. What are you going to do? What we're going to do is to, to try and assess 50,000 people who have survived COVID-19. And we're interested in monitoring them over time and trying to establish whether they have cognitive difficult, uh, difficulties, whether they're having problems with things like memory and concentration. And if so, whether those, whether those problems get better over time, whether they stay stable, whether they get worse. So we're simply asking people to log into uh, a website we've set up, covidbrainstudy.com, uh, and to give us some, some information about what happened to them during uh, their experience with COVID-19. It's, it's all completely anonymous, of course. We're not taking personal information, but we do want to know what happened to people. And then we ask them to complete some fun, simple tests of memory, concentration, planning, problem solving, these sorts of things. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and find out whether these, these problems are worse in, for example, people who've been ventilated, people who spent time in the ICU, or are these problems that everybody gets? Do they affect some people more than other people? Do they, are they transient and they'll go away a year from now, or are they permanent? There are many, many unanswered questions that we're going to get at with this study. Okay, I have questions based on that answer. So let me go a couple of them. Number one, 50,000, that seems like a very large number. And I know you're looking global for, for people, participants in this study. What does that 50,000 figure enable you to, to, to get? What do you get in that group that will help your research? Well, of course, 50,000 is an enormous enormous size for, for any sort of study of this sort. Although, you know, j just yesterday I, uh, I, I was looking on Facebook for survival groups, people who've had COVID-19, and I immediately came across a group of 47,000 people who were many of whom were, were complaining of these kind of memory and concentration deficits. So actually, I don't think 50,000 is going to be very difficult to get. But we need, we need that number because there are so many factors involved here. Some people have been on ventilators. Some people have been in the ICU. We know that being in the ICU is not good for you cognitively. We published a study just last year showing that obviously pre-COVID, but people who've spent time in the ICU will have a lot of trouble returning to normal activities of daily living, normal cognitive functions. So these people are likely to have problems. But what about everybody else? There are many asymptomatic people. We know that old people are being affected more than young people. So to, to really pull apart all these different factors and work out what exactly is going on, we need to start with a lot of people. And you get that 50,000. Well, we're talking about 10 million cases globally, so you certainly have many from, from which to draw. Um, when you say over time, how long are you going to be studying this? Well, I think there are, there are sort of immediate questions we can answer mm -hmm. and long-term questions. So uh, we're going to look, look at people over the course of a year. They don't have to work on the study for the whole year. They'll just check in from time, time to time and tell us how they're doing and check, check, we'll check how they're doing on the tests. So uh, you know, I think a, a year out, uh, we should be able to establish whether these problems are, are likely to be going away or whether they're likely to be permanent. Or worst case scenario, it, it could be that some people deteriorate over time. But of course, in the immediate term, we can find out right now 
who, how many people are experiencing these problems and what exactly are they? When you say these are the questions you're seeking to answer, do you go into this research free of expectations or do you have a hypothesis already about what may be going on in the brain as a result of COVID? Well, we know that, I mean, it's, it's completely unclear right now whether COVID has direct effects on the brain. But there are some things that we do know. We know there will be indirect effects, effects of inflammation, uh, blood clots. Uh, many people or, or, or groups of people are having strokes uh, whilst presenting with COVID-19 symptoms. And of course, we know a lot about all of these things and how they affect the brain. We know that being on sedation can affect your cognitive function. We know that being on a ventilator, because it interrupts the oxygen supply to the brain. So there are many things that we can already predict about who is likely to have the biggest problems and what those problems might be. But there are also an enormous number of unknowns. And these are the things that you're going to uh, come to know over the course of this study. At the end of it all, what do you hope the, the research has by way of impact? Are you looking at therapies and treatments or where might this lead? Well, as you say, uh, there are 10 million people, you know, right now with this problem. If a year from now we have 10 million people presenting with cognitive deficits, this is a huge economic and societal problem that we really need to get on top of right now. And the only way we can really think about therapies or starting to work out how we can mitigate problems down the line is if we really understand what those problems are now. So, yes, we're certainly looking forward to therapies and interventions that might help people. But before we can do that, we need to truly understand the problem. Professor Owen, I hope you'll come back and tell us later how the research is going, what you've learned uh, at the conclusion of all of this. It's a very interesting project, and I'm uh, delighted to have you telling us about it this morning. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Heather.